I'm super excited you guys are joining us for this fifth week of teaching in this series I'm calling Detox. Next week is the absolute final week to this series, so make sure you are with us. You don't want to miss the last week of this series. But today, I want to talk about what I'm calling a character boost. I'll, talk, I'll explain that a little further uh, in just a few moments. Uh, if you are with us on last week, you know I talked about this quiet epidemic that is uh, moving across the country and across the world. Here in America, over 100 million people are suffering and dealing with, wrestling with loneliness. And it's women, it's men. It's people who are married, people who are single. It's folk who are, uh, have children and those who don't have any children. People who are aging and those who are young adults suffering with loneliness. And one of the insights I tried to teach you was that whenever you think loneliness, uh, what you want to think is disconnection. Everybody shout disconnection. Yeah, you're emotionally disconnected, spiritually disconnected, and uh, socially disconnected. So, for example, it's very possible for you to have a, a, a tight relationship with God, so you're connected vertically, but still feel lonely and disconnected because you don't have the kind of relationship you need with other people. And so, what I said to you was, if you're struggling with loneliness, here was the insight. You are not alone. In your loneliness. Not only are you surrounded by folk, but God is with you. And I challenged you uh, to reach out and reach out by learning how to relate to people from the inside out. And I also said that if you're not struggling with loneliness, then that means that God wants to use you uh, to pay attention to somebody in your life who is struggling with loneliness. And so you need to reach out. Be observant. Pay attention. That was last week. This week, I want to just take another step forward. You know, the loneliness in the context of our message last week was really a, had a lot to do with what, what happens to us. Today, I want to talk a little bit more uh, about uh, what, in a sense, some of the stuff that we do to ourselves. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what it means to, uh, in a sense, Drift away from people. Drift away from being connected. And to be aware of it and yet continue to drift. So I'm calling this message a character boost because I really want to horn in at how our character has everything to do uh, with uh, how we work hard to stay connected. And here's, here's a great uh, definition for character. Uh, one person says that character is this. It's the decisions you make when no one is looking. Another person I read the other day says this. It's the decisions you make when you're under pressure. You know, characteristics have everything, everything to do with, uh, you, know, you know, what people perceive of you. You know, it, is, is this person brilliant? Is this person good looking? Is this person educated? Does this person have a lot of money, a lot of wealth, these externals? But who you are is really revealed what you do when no one is looking and what decisions you make when under pressure. And there is no better passage to kind of do some teaching around this than the work and the story of, of uh, Adam and Eve. And so we were there last weekend. I want to return to it this weekend. And uh, let's hear what the right of Genesis 3 verses 1 through 6a has to say. We'll move forward. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals in the Lord, the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Like, Really? Of course we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat, God said. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened and as soon as you eat it. You will be like God. Knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. And there ends the reading. All right. Here's the big ideal of today's teaching. This is this. Take a picture of it. 
It is dangerous to be emotionally, socially, and spiritually disconnected for an extended period of time. And uh, here's another take on what I'm sharing here. It's this. Don't get lost in your head. Don't get lost in your head. Well, what do you mean? Uh, John Ortberg uh, now does a YouTube teaching. It's about 10 minutes. Uh, I think it's three or four times a week. And last week, one of the teachings he did was called uh, Tell a Friend. And inside of this teaching, he talked about the value, the importance of being able to tell a friend when you're going through difficult things or tell a friend when you're celebrating wonderful things. And as he illustrated that point, he pointed to a very famous book, novel known as Crime and Punishment. Here's the deal here. And what's fascinating, he quoted a a piece out of it, and I actually went and took a look at it, is that the primary character in this novel, Crime and Punishment, was a really good guy. But he allowed himself to drift, to drift away into isolation and disconnection. And he continued to get more isolated and more isolated and more disconnected. And inside of that isolated space, he got lost in his own head. And he started to think about what it would be like to kill one of his nemesis, the, uh, the kind of the palm shop owner. And, and at first he started thinking, you know, uh, you know, it would be a relief. And then later on, he starts to think about how to do it. And then later on inside of his head, he started to think about, you know, it would be a good. He would be he would be doing a, a good thing for the earth. Uh, to destroy this person's life. And he ends up, this is good guy, initially, ends up murdering this lady. That's all because he got lost in his head. Here's how he's described. And I want you to lean in here because you might recognize yourself in this description. The author is trying to describe this guy, and he says this. Uh, he has just described earlier how this guy uh, would um, go up and down the stairs and he wanted to make sure that the landlady didn't see him because she'd be always pressing him for money, et cetera, et cetera. And so he had just gotten by without the landlady seeing him. And then the author's trying to explain this guy's state of mind. He says this, for some time past, he had been in an overstrained, irritable condition, verging on hypochondria. He had become so completely absorbed in himself and isolated from his fellows. Look at that. So completely absorbed in himself until he had become isolated from his fellows, from his community. That he dreaded meeting not only the landlady that he was trying to avoid, but anyone at all. If you are in a situation where because of whatever's going on in the pandemic, where because of the toxicity of the politics uh, in this country, where because of the pain that you have experienced uh, from this person or that person or this person, or because of the pain that maybe you've run into and you've experienced at church, and, and you're, just, you're in a place right now where you're thinking, you know what, I, I just kind of want to back away from people. I just want to push back from people. And, and you're beginning to drift and drift and drift. I want to tell you that's a dangerous route to be on. Now, let me just make a distinction. Uh, for example, there are those who are introverted, uh, like my daughter, for example, uh, who just needs some time to be away from people. She goes to school every day. Uh, she comes home. She spends about an hour with us eating dinner and hanging out with us. And then she does what she, <laughs> she, she, does what she calls her deep people time. <laughs> so she spends the rest of the you know, next few hours doing her homework and away from people. Well, that's cool. But if that becomes not just a few hours, but you're waking up every day and you're going to bed every night and you're avoiding more and more and more people. You're, being, you're, you're becoming lost in your head. 
I just want you to know that, 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 that life will set you up for self-deception and you can find yourself doing some harmful things to yourself or some harmful things to others. So if that's you, tell a friend. That's right. Find somebody that you can talk to and tell what's going on inside of your head. Begin the process of reconnecting. It is not good to be socially and emotionally disconnected from people. Taking a, a page out of what God said about Adam we talked about last week. It's not good for man to be alone. It's not good to be socially and emotionally disconnected from others. Everybody shout, disconnected. I want to show you this in the text. It's a fascinating text. Look at this text. Uh, Satan, serpent, the serpent in this story represents Satan, represents evil, represents uh, the demonic reality, reps represents the seduction and the seductor in the story. And he has a dialogue going on with Eve. Here's his dialogue. Here's how it starts. Did God really say, did he really say, I mean, right, which, 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 I mean, I mean, is it possible that God would, would think so outrageously as to suggest, that's all wrapped up here, that you must not eat the fruit from any of these beautiful trees in the garden? And that spins the dialogue. And uh, the, next, the, the, the dialogue ends with the next verse, right? The dialogue ends with, 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 with the text saying, and the woman was convinced. Okay, here's what I want to suggest. I, I don't know this for... for true, but this is my observation of the text and my observation of how this thing works in reality. You see, I think that in reality, I had a good friend, a mentor who used to say, when people say the devil made me do it, says, that's never true. The devil didn't make you do it. He just reminded you that it was available, right? Here's my take on this text. The devil didn't make Eve and Adam uh, violate God's requirement not to eat the fruit. He just amplified the stuff they were already thinking. Because if you notice the text there, they are this unique. Eve is over here and, and uh, Adam is over here. We have no record of them dialoguing ever about what the serpent is talking to them about. But I suspect that the, the serpent is echoing externally what was an ongoing internal dialogue that they kept secret in their head. Can I really trust this God? Why is it that he's keeping this particular tree from us? How come I can't eat this tree? This tree, the fruit looks just as beautiful as the fruit over here. This doesn't really make sense to me. And, and, and this internal dialogue that's going on, the serpent, I believe, picks up on it and amplifies it. And what happens is, Eve and ultimately Adam becomes convinced of their own, watch this, self-deception. That's why you got to be careful getting lost in your head. So here's the question I have for you. What are you hiding? What's going on in your life that you're not talking to anyone about? You know, character is the decisions that we make when no one is looking. Well, what's going on in your life that you're afraid to talk to anyone about? Is there a feeling or is there a sin or is there some other thing that's maybe even happening to you that you need to tell a friend? And John Orberg pointed out that oftentimes we don't tell people things that we need to talk about because we're afraid that the moment we tell somebody about the craziness that's going on in our heads or the craziness that's going on in our lives, we concede the option of engaging in it. The moment I tell you and you tell me that that's crazy or that's harmful or that's, you know, that's, that's poisonous, then I can no longer in good conscience do what a part of me wants to do. You know, I think um, people have this phrase, they, uh, they say you, get a, you, you, you can get a protein boost, uh, you can get an energy boost, there's these boosts you can get, drink these things and they help you boost. 
I'm suggesting, and I'm hoping that in this message, we all can get a character boost. That we think about the things that we want to do when no one is looking. And rather than doing it, you tell a friend. You tell a friend. Here's the other point here I want to make. So what are you hiding? Tell God and tell a friend. All right, and then this point right here. Watch this. Be a friend. Be the friend that someone can come to you and talk to you about what's going on in their heads that they have not shared with anybody else. That child can come and have that conversation with you. That sibling can come and have that conversation. That colleague can say, this is a person that it is safe for me to have the conversation with. Well, here's here's one requirement that is important for you to be that kind of person, right? You've got to be the kind of person that people have to know that when they talk to you, they have what I call a no condemnation space in, your, in you. That there's a space there that they come and engage with you that, that, that the first thing that you're going to say to them is not going to be condemnation. The, the look that they're going to first experience from you will not be condemnation. Here's one of my favorite texts about Jesus and what we, what we gain when we're in relationship with Jesus. It's this. Uh, in Romans chapter 8, Paul says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And what he's saying is that when we come to Jesus, the law, the Jewish law, reveals all of the ways that we are guilty and all the ways that we're wrong. And yet because Jesus has paid the price for all of the things that we've done wrong on Calvary Cross, that when we come to him, we come into a space of grace, and the first thing we experience from him is never condemnation. The, the first look that we get from Jesus is never condemnation. So here's my little quick practical insight for you. You know, train your look. So when people come and they want to open up their heart, don't look at them. You know, some of us, we have that look. We have that look. You don't say anything, but you've got the look. Here's, the, here's what the look says. It's the, the look says what Fred Sampson and Sanford and Son used to always say to his, his son, Lamont, if you know that, that old series. He used to look at Lamont when Lamont would mess up. And, and, and that look would say, you big dummy. <laughs> and then he'd follow it up with the words, you big dummy. <laughs> Train your look. And then when people come to you, you keep, you know, and you ask them, you, sometimes it's not what you ask, it's how you ask. You can say, well, why did you do that? And the blank at the end, they'll fill it in because of how you say it. Why did you do that, stupid? Or you can ask the same question. Well, what were you thinking when you did that? I'm just curious. And compassion comes. Just make sure your posture is that you, people you're engaging in, that the first words out your mouth, the first look they experience is a no condemnation look. Be that friend. And then here's the last point. Don't return pain for pain. Now, I don't know if this is the best label, but, but it allows me to back into this final point that I want to make. One of the challenging things is that we, 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 we tend to have in our minds certain images about people, people that we marry, people who are our parents, people who we look up to as heroes and herons, mentors. And then we discover something about their lives that is shocking and painful. And... It's the opposite of what we thought of them. And then we have to decide, what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Now, to some degree, God experiences this with Adam and Eve. He doesn't discover. I think he already knew this was there. But he experiences people that he's poured out everything for, turning on him. Turning on him. Hurting him in the process. And God has to figure out, do I kill them or do I redeem them? It's a question that you and I have to wrestle with. Let, let me just give you a couple of examples. You know, as a kid growing up as a history major, I had a whole lot of admiration for the founding fathers of this country. People like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. I read all the books I could read about. I was just enamored with them. And then as a young adult uh, going through 
uh, college historical studies, I discovered that they own slaves. I mean, lots of slaves. <laughs> I was wounded by that. I was like, what am I going to do with this? John F. Kennedy. You know, when I was growing up in an African-American home in my hometown, uh, John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., and a European expression of Jesus was usually in everybody's houses or on the fans that we were fan with because Robert Kennedy and John F. Kennedy, who was the president at the time, and oftentimes reluctantly, but nevertheless made history again and again as he partnered with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and really pushed forward the context that allowed Mr. Johnson to drive through major civil rights changes. So African-Americans always looked up to John F. Kennedy. And then I discovered later in life that he was a horrible philanderer, that he just ran women, how he, his wife was pregnant, about to lose a child, and he's out with other women. And, and suddenly this guy who I thought had impeccable moral character, like, what am I going to do with that? By the way, I should point out that if you are more on the conservative side, you hear and know about the slavery and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson's lives, but you basically accommodate that. But there are those who, in that same camp, when they hear about what John F. Kennedy do, they say, hey, get rid of him, wipe him out. He's no good. On the other hand, there are people who are on the left, they hear about John F. Kennedy's horrible infidelity, and they say, well, we have to accommodate his humanness there. But when they th read about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson having slaves, it's like, wipe them out. And then there's my grand aunt and uncle. You know how this, you, you've heard this before, I'm sure. Uh, you, you've heard me many times talk about my love for my grand aunt and uncle. They shaped me. Well, one time when I was about four, 15, 14 years old, maybe 15 years old, they got into an argument, a huge argument, something I hadn't seen in, you know, it wasn't a normal part of our experience. And lo and behold, both of them used profanity. I was shocked. Now, I realize that in today's world, <laughs> that is nothing to be shocked about. It's so much a part of the experience of the culture. But just get, I had been, I was 15 years old. I'd never used either, heard any of them use anything close to profanity. And they were using profanity at one another. And the realization was wounding to me. It shattered my picture. What were I going to do with that? And then, of course, there's me, right? There's, you, know, you know, we can always look at others and we can judge others. A couple of years ago, I was at an event uh, on the East Coast, and a number of us had gathered together across diversity, and we were trying to figure out as faith leaders, what could we do to push back against the division that was happening in this country so often and so regularly. And uh, one lady over dinner told the story about how a preacher had gotten up this is the 20th anniversary of 9-11 here in America. And, and back then she was talking about how Osama bin Laden had been killed and how this preacher had gotten up the Sunday after his death was announced, thinking about the 2,000 plus people that had been killed as a result of his planning, his evil. And the preacher said, I hope that he, Osama bin Laden, busts hell wide open. And the mother, daughter, was so offended that she couldn't go back to that church. She thought that was so inconsistent with understanding of Jesus in the gospel. I just lost my cool at the table. I thought that was so outrageous. We keep doing this again and again. That night I went home and to, to go to bed to prepare for the devotion. I was in charge of doing the devotion the next day. And the Lord tapped me on the shoulder and reminded me of an episode where I was preaching years earlier in Roxbury Presbyterian Church. And I said, some of you guys don't believe in hell, but I, I hope there's a hell. Because I'm thinking about all of the people doing slavery who were raped and abused by these slave owners and overseers. And these slave owners and overseers lived for, you know, they messed up these families and they got to live a ripe old age, die wealthy and comfortable. 
He said, I hope there's a hell. I hope there's some eternal justice there somewhere. And then suddenly I was shocked. I mean, I was saying the same thing that the other preacher has said. Isn't that interesting? Don't we always think we're better than other people? Don't we always think that there's something just a little better in our quality and our morality than the other person? Look at this. Watch this. Here's an interesting quote by this Russian um, author who was a dissident, Soviet uh, dissident. Here's what he wrote. If only it was all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it was necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and just destroy them, right? But it's not that simple, is it? The line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being, not between us, but through us. And who's willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? You get the point? <laughs> we, we like to say the world is black and white and that people are black and white. You're either good or evil. But what this writer is saying is the same thing what Scripture says. Here's what Paul reminds us of what Scripture says. This is why Jesus had to come and die for all of us. This is why we all need a Savior, right? This is why we all need redemption. Here's what the Scripture says. says no one is righteous, not even one. And a little later on, Paul says, for we have all fallen short of God's standard. And a little later on, he says, and this is why Jesus, his son, had to create righteousness for us by dying in our place on Calvary's cross that God might ascribe to us that which we could not earn on us on our own, nor keep on our own. Why? Because like Adam and Eve, we are this unique mixture of good and bad. It's in our character. You know, your character is revealed by the choices you make under pressure. And we're that unique mixture. So, you know, today in our culture, we're beginning to figure out how to cut people out of our lives who, fit, who, who doesn't fit our criteria for, you know, righteousness or rightness, right? We all have our kind of favorite sin. If you slip over into that sin, then I'm cutting, even if you're not a Christian, and you don't even use the word sin, there are people that you're cutting out of your life off of your Facebook page. And I just thought about this, right? So let me just walk back through some of my examples. You know, I'm still a history major. And, and let's just say George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, they, they, they committed the, the unforgivable sin. They had slaves. Let's wipe them out. And then let's say, you know, John F. Kennedy, you know, he wasn't perfect either. He, this philanderer, infidelity all over the place. You know what? He's not the guy I thought he was. Let's wipe him out. Then what about my grand aunt and uncle when I discovered that they weren't as perfect and as pristine and as above stain as I thought they were and as they, in a sense, had raised me to be? Well, maybe I should just wipe them out. What about myself? What happens when I discover that I'm not all that I say that I am? Wouldn't that mean I have to wipe me out too? But thanks be to God, for we have the victory in Jesus Christ who says, this is how much I love you. I love you so much that I don't want you wiping yourself out. I don't want you wiping out Kennedy or your grand aunt or your grand uncle or the Washington or Jefferson. You all have sinned and fallen short of the glory, and you all would be wiped out with the exception of the fact I'm going to pay the price. God demonstrates his love for us that while we were yet sinners and yet powerless to do anything to help ourselves, he died for the ungodly and all of us are in the ungodly. God says, Jesus says, I will die so you can live. That's the good news of the gospel. And he expects, especially Jesus' followers, to live out of that place of grace and mercy. Yeah. And understand that the world is a little more complicated. People are not all one thing or the other. And yes, Jesus died because from Jesus' perspective, I don't know how all this works, but from his perspective, 
we're all redeemable. We're all redeemable. Look how the verse ends, and I'm finished. He was supposed to kill him. The day you eat, that's the day you die. But he doesn't. Here's what the text says. Then the man Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins. This is suggesting that animals were sacrificed for the very first time. Their blood was shed and their, 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 their skin was turned into clothing to cover these naked people who could no longer be exposed. To cover them. And it is the first hint of what would come down the line of time that Jesus would share his blood and that his righteousness would cover us. And as a righteous people, we should be a people who avoid the dark, who works hard not to get disconnected. But when we are tempted, we tell a friend, we tell God, and we seek to be that kind of person that we have learned Jesus is. What he's done for us, we do for each other. Amen and amen. God, I thank you. Open the eyes of those who are listening. Help us all to see. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this is perhaps for me one of the most important parts of the teaching moment. It's an opportunity for you to respond to what you heard God say to you and figure out what's your next step. So if you're watching my way of Facebook, there's a link to our connection card is popping up. If you have our app, of course, you can go directly to our connection card and get directly to uh, next steps of with Jesus. And uh, there, you know, you got a couple of options that you can check. The first and foremost option is this is another opportunity for you to say, you know what? I want Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I want him to have the final word over my tomorrow and over my destiny, period. You know, in Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation. Here's your opportunity to check that box and say yes to Jesus. And there are some other options there for you as well. And then for all the rest of us, I want to challenge you uh, as it relates to the response to the message. And uh, it's it's. In a form of a prayer, as I usually puts it, I'm suggesting you pray this prayer throughout the course of this week. God, help me to tell a friend and be a friend offering support and help. Essentially, if there's something you need to share, I want God to connect you to a person you can share. Or, on the other hand, be the person that someone can share stuff that's going on in their lives with. And then here's the reflection question. It's a pretty deep reflection question. Take a picture of it. It's simply this. In what area is fear dominating my life and dictating my actions?